Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Kuchina Aurora podcast. Another fabulous episode of Conversational Witchcraft with the amazing, the one and only, the glam witch, Michael Herkus. Michael has been practice, has been practicing modern witchcraft for over 20 years. As a devotee of the goddess Lilith, he anchors his practice with the use of glamour, love, moon, and sex magic. Michael is the author of The Amazing Glam Witch, The Complete Book of Moon Spells, Witchcraft for Daily Self-Care, one of my personal favorites, Love Spells for the Modern Witch, and Moon Spells for Beginners. Oh my God, Glam Witch, Glam Witch, he's here. Okay, so we tried to do this like a hundred (laughs) times, right? Like how many times have we rescheduled this? Oh my God, I know. Okay, well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, um, so excited to do this. We probably rescheduled this for about six times. I mean, at uh, least. Over at the least. course of like the last eight months. So mm-hmm. it's, it was meant to happen now, which is great. Yes. Um, and thank so, you for being here. I'm so excited okay. to have you. I, before, before we hit the record button, I was like, I gotta stalk you on Facebook because I think your eye makeup is amazing. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I was so intimidated. I was like, I'm interviewing Michael Herkus the Glam Witch on Saturday morning. I'm like, I literally went to the salon yesterday and got my hair done. Okay, mm-hmm. I swear to God, like I got my balayage redone. And look, look, can you see, I put on real eyeliner for you. Yes, like, I put on eyeliner, but for some, my, I'm like having a huge allergy attack this morning. So my eyes are watering and I can feel them coming down. So I might look crazy, but it's look, okay. There's beauty in the crazy. You, you know, I, 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 I wrote you too. I was like, are we recording this? Cause I kind of <laughs> want to like, look like a monster. Cause truth be told, I got in at 4 a.m. this morning. Um, so I had to like take a quick cat nap and then wake back up. So some of this is leftover makeup from last night. Um, well, my friend, you are, you are rocking that. Uh, I, where yeah. are you in the world? I'm in New England. Where I, are you? I'm in Chicago. Chicago. So we're, are we like one hour ahead of you? One hour? Yeah, you're one hour ahead of me. One hour ahead. So it's you're not, the, yeah. What's the future? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 for me, I'm, I'm ahead of the game a little bit, but I didn't sleep all last night. If you can see my cat in the background. I have two oh, little. Around here. Oh, he's sleeping right now, but he gets jealous when I'm talking in the house to somebody else other than him. So he'll, he'll chirp. He'll probably be meowing at some point. What's his name? Fuji. What's your name? Fuji. Yeah. It's adorable. So we have two, they're about a year and a half old and uh-huh. they're a bonded pair of kittens and they're completely black, except one uh-huh. of them has like a little white patch and mm-hmm. um, they're ginormous. They're like 20 pounds each. And they're like a year and a half. Mine too. Like he's a, a Bengal, a hybrid <gasps> cat that looks like a leopard. So he's a, he's a silver charcoal. So he's got, you know, his back is all really, really dark. And then it ombres down to like white essentially. And then he's got You're- big black blotches on his sides you're literally gonna have to bring him out i'm gonna have to see his face like it's <laughs> it's you don't have to do it now but at some time yeah. in the next hour i'm gonna have to see his face um okay. the boys are serious black cat and olivander um because i'm a giant oh. harry potter nerd and um i love them to pieces but they were up in the, i don't know they were up in the middle of the night like playing with shit and they, pulling, pulling my husband's glasses off his they, night table and i was like seriously guys i have a, an interview in the morning okay Come on, <laughs> come on. Yes. You are spectacularly gorgeous. I cannot believe that this is you waking up, going to bed at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I was whooping it up. I had a hard week because <laughs> believe Did it or you? not, but, but the glam witch is not my full-time gig. So yeah, I, I uh, work for um, a law firm uh, and uh, do legal administrative type of stuff, yeah. kind of manage the workflow of a department and yeah. we're really fucking busy. And so yeah. it's just been a lot. It's like 60 hour weeks at this point. So um, I needed to go out and release some steam. Yes. So I did. That. And then tonight I was like, I may as well get all like made up again because on Saturday nights, I read tarot cards at this new fabulous little gem in Chicago called um, Buzz by Zaya. It's a beauty bar. So during the day, it's a salon and you can get your hair buzzed. And then at night, it turns into a bar and then you can get another kind of buzzed. <laughs> so I do, I'm their in house tarot reader on Saturday nights. So I'll be there. that's fucking I outstanding. I've been to it's Chicago, been-, been to Chicago like maybe twice. And of course, like, to the airport in Chicago a hundred times because yeah. uh, everybody stops there, right? But yeah. never have I had a desire to go, but that place sounds 
Oh, it's like, so fabulous and it's quaint and it's really, really cute and beautiful. And of course, buzzed, it's, they're all like about the bee and of course bees and witchcraft and just the, yes. the like symbolism, I love it. And then the bar itself is like lit up and has squares. So it kind of has this honeycomb vibe to it. Um, just really, really delicious, fabulous, like fine, fine dining, but with liquor. You know, I love of, that. Okay, listen, uh, anything with food, right? Kitchen Witch, I'm into it. Yes, you know? it's not, well, this one's not a food place, but uh, hopefully maybe at one point they'll start. Mm. But drinks and mixology and- And witchcraft. Whole, and like witchcraft, Saturday, like these things, Saturday they just, Saturday. they go together, don't they? They sure do. They sure yeah. go together. You know, <laughs> it's so, so, okay. Obviously, Glam Witch yes. is, is pretty much how people know you, right? Like, and you said like, that's not all I do, but- Glam, which is, that was your first real, wasn't that your first real big book? And yeah, so the, the whole story with that was, I mean, of course, you know, and you said the beautiful intro, I've, I've been studying, practicing witchcraft for over 20 years at this point. Yeah. Um, I turned 33 in a couple of months. I started reading, you know, Teen Witch, Silver Ravenwolf. Yeah, back when Silver I, Ravenwolf. Yeah, we're, we all started in that way. In yes. that capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've always been very, very solitary. And so it wasn't until 2017, I went to Hexfest in New Orleans and uh, reconnected with my friend Fiona Horn and started writing for Which Way Magazine. And then, um, you know, at that point, you know, my first article was about Lilith. And when it came out, I knew I needed to change my Instagram name. And while I was in New Orleans, um, I met someone and we went to a gay bar after the festivals and stuff. And he was like, you need to teach witches how to be glamorous. You are the glam witch. And I was like, okay. So that I kind of got named from him to be completely honest. Love um, it. So then when I was deciding to write my first book, you know, I went through all these different titles, like it was going to be Lilithian magic and Lilithian witchcraft. And, you know, at one point I was just like, no, like this is my introduction to the world. It's going to yeah. be the glam witch because it's yeah. my manifesto for how I live my life and how I've done my path up until now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's my story. Um, and, yeah. you know, with, with my job that I do, I do a lot of research on, on companies that are coming in and a lot of them have acronyms. So over the course of the, the 11 years I've been in the legal field, um, you know, I've come to really kind of love acronyms and trying to figure them out. So at first I was like, glam, let me make it an acronym. Um, you know, and maybe <laughs> goddess Lilith and Michael, Ooh, but that was like so narcissistic. And it I was feels, like, it feels like, forced too, you know, like, oh, really? Yeah. So I was like, nope. And then I was just like, okay, great. Well, there's an L. So that's Lilith. We, we do great. And then magic and mysteries. What's the A? And then I was listening to this song by Tennis called um, Please Don't Ruin This For Me. And it's such a supernatural, like witchy song. It's like talking about the altar and a flame and a serpent yeah. and a mirror. And then she's just like arcane. And I was just like, oh, wait, I know that word. Okay, we're going to do the great <laughs> Lilithian arcane mysteries. That's what glam is to me, baby. So, um, that's what turned into this this little book that is really honestly kind of like the little book that could. I mean, when I yeah. I pitched it to a couple of of you know major witch publishers and they mm -hmm. all rejected it. Of course. Uh, and then, you know, because it's different. It's it's real. It's not like there's like the normal fluff that goes into you know certain books and and there's uh -huh. dark like sex work and I mean, not that that's dark, but it's taboo. No, still but in the especially in the time like I mean this is this book has been out for a while. So yeah. Yeah, 2019. Right, so 2019. So that's, that's, oh well, my God, it's like four years almost. So, right? Yeah, right? it's 2022 no. now. Ugh. Well, yeah. I don't know. I've lost time. COVID I know, screwed. I know. But I've like, lost like, year. we gained a year. I don't know what the hell happened. Right. <laughs> but even four years ago, five years ago, big publishers were still kind of shying away from those sort of topics. And now they're starting to go, oh, wait, the, the community needs and this of course, work. Anything to do with Lilith, because there's not been great information on her you know, ever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that was, an, yeah. I was like, I want to write the book that I needed for my young little witch Michael when he started working with Lilith, you know, in his teens. So that was this, the whole reason I wrote the book. I really just, I, I didn't know what to expect. I just knew I always wanted to be an author. I wanted to put a book out there, poured my whole heart and soul into it. And of course it had kind of like a slow start um, and everything, but right now it's blowing the hell up and I love it. It's kind of like, you know, I, I love, a little bit of celebrity culture and, and musicians and stuff and how there's always that like first CD from an artist and it doesn't get a lot of play and no one really cares about it. They're very underground and obscure. And then they start doing all of these other more mainstream books, which was book four or five, <laughs> all of the other ones. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, then, you know, people start catching on to the other one and then it just blows up and it's like, there's this huge appreciation for it. So I love that. And I'm just really happy that people have enjoyed what I've written. You know, it's for yeah. them. If it touched one person and it helps invigorate them in their practice that yeah. I did my job. And so yeah. um, that's how I've looked at, at writing. And it's beautiful. Can- and it's true, right? Because the thing is that people your work stands, you know what I mean? It stands for itself. And so people find it when it's right for them. And sometimes I I think oftentimes authors, especially those of us that are maybe you're, you're, you're expressing yourself, your craft, your beliefs in a book. Right. But what you don't realize is the, the marketing angle or the business angle. And I, you see this a lot with other, with artists and authors, especially pagan authors, I think that there's a missing piece and that missing piece is branding. And so, uh, yeah. right. You came out with this glam, witch and created a brand, created a look yeah. for yourself. Look. <laughs> Correct. So, yeah. I remember doing, going to this class, um, Christian day taught at a hex fest at one point it was about career witchcraft. Yeah. And I loved it. It was like, I wasn't even like known. I, I writ, wrote a couple articles in a magazine and in it, you know, their branding topic came up and I, he called me out in it and was like, you know, Michael Herkus, the glam witch is a prime example of how Absolutely. to, to brand yourself if you're going to do something different, if you want to go into witchcraft is from a business standpoint. So I've done it and not, I mean, just to kind of put it out there, cause I haven't talked about it. And I know we're, we're now we're jumping into this kind of conversation, but you know, there's, there is a part of me that kind of feels like the glam witch needs a revamp and, Ooh. uh, like in some kind of a ways there needs to be some kind of a reinvention or an elevation because and I, it could also be the fact that I'm an Aries and I always want to grow and I have a lot of ambition right. uh but I kind of feel like I'm plateaued and I need to do something different so I'm looking at different ways to reinvent rebrand reconfigure um and and do something a little different because I've been doing the same thing for a hot minute now so you know um, th- that's interesting right because I think I, <laughs> as human beings as witches, as people, we are, we should be anyway, constantly evolving our practice and right. I mean, we should be, we could, we should be constantly evolving our practice. We should be constantly evolving our, our emotional intelligence and our mental health and our physical health and all those things. We should yeah. always be thinking about, you know, at least for me in my life, I'm always like, how can I be the better version of myself? It doesn't go, Oh, I'm, I did this thing and that's it. And now that, you know, I'm always like, what's the next thing. And recently because I've been doing kitchen witchery and been known as the kitchen witch for like a decade now. I'm like, does everybody think I'm a one trick pony? Like that in, in, imposter syndrome sets in and you're like, uh, that's, there's right. That's what I'm about right now too. And it, I think a big chunk of it has to do with this work, this Venus and retrograde that we have going on right Talk now. Talk to me about like that. Venus and retrograde has always been more intense for me than Mercury. And part of it is because my, my chart is dominated in Venus. Like Obviously. Sign. So, you know, I have the, the Aries sun, but it's conjunct with my Venus sign, which is in Taurus and Taurus right. is ruled by Venus. So it's, there's that. And um, yeah, my Mercury is also in Taurus, which is a Venus place. So right now this dual retrograde is like hell for me. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's only it's, been like two days, right? Like it's. No, the, well, the, the Venus retrograde started in December. It ends oh, right, right, the end right. of uh, and then, yeah, Mercury just started, I think, a week or so ago, but it yeah. was in the shadow phase and blah, 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 all these different things. But, um, you know, with with the Venus retrograde, of course, that's the time to pause on elements of beauty. Hello, glamour, love, um, even finances, luxury, all of those different things. And of course, it happened. It started in Capricorn season, which then leads, you know, limitations. It sets structure and boundaries. So it's just it's kind of like you feel like a fish out of water. And that's how I've been feeling. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm so happy for it to be done. And I think that there's going to be, you know, coming out of this on the flip side of it, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of um, clarity on where I need to go and what I need to do to reinvent, re-evolve, reshape, become more in, like inspired uh, mm-hmm. and then go from there. But um, still maintaining who you are and the exactly. integrity of Michael Herkus, the glam witch, yeah. you know, it can incorporate all those other things, all the newness, all of the things that you've learned from the beginning to now. And I think that's the challenge, you know, in our practices is to say, well, I, I used to do it this way, or I used to feel that way about it. And now I feel differently, or now I practice differently. How do I express that and still maintain the integrity of who I am, especially as a public witch? 
Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's funny because I thought about that too. The other day I did um, a, a very lovely, I was a, a guest speaker for an international like group of uh, women in, in this beautiful coven. And we talked about the Glam Witch and people ask questions because every member of it, the 80 women got a copy of the book. So and great. so they were like, you know, with these you know, with this book, there's so many rituals and they're very elaborate. You have a lot of different ingredients and, you know, do we need all of these? Can we do substitutions? Like, absolutely. Like, well, number one, I am extra. Like, hello, if you hadn't, couldn't tell. So I like a lot of the props. I like a lot of the aesthetics because yeah. to me, it helps me get into the mindset. It helps me get into that place. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, yeah, I remember that. I mean, that was the kind of stuff that I was have been doing for a while. But if we look at my practice now, a couple of years later, now that I'm a writer and I'm out here teaching and I'm doing writing and, you know, working my job and still trying to maintain a friendship and everything, my rituals in witchcraft, it's not as necessarily like elaborate and these big, like fantastic rituals and stuff like it used to be. It's a little bit more this Dude. is going to probably like bad <laughs> to some people, but like witch on the go. Cause that's my life. I'm a absolutely witch go, 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 go. Yes. So it's fine. You know, kiss my statue on my altar. Goodbye. You know, every now and then and out, you know, observe the full moon just by looking out the window and think, Oh my gosh, you're so fabulous. And tonight I'm writing and I know what sign you're in and I can feel that. And, you know, like the other night it was a, a cancer full moon and I was writing and working and I was just like, you know, I ended up having like scallops for dinner because I was like, okay, hey, cancer full moon, you know, the seafood, yada, yada, yada. Yep. So that was my way. I just ate under the full moon at my window and ate scallops, you know, maybe not 100% that magical ritual that we all kind of think it is but you know it was meaningful to me so yes my practice is evolving with how I evolve um and of course different seasons I talk about it in um I think I think it got cut from the self-care book and got put into the moon spells for beginner book mm -hmm. where I talk about how just like the like the earth has its seasons we have our seasons as well and we have times where we don't feel as witchy or we don't feel as much like we want to do you know all of that but then we have those other ones where it makes sense like for me spring and fall is when I feel like I'm I'm full-on witch it's mm -hmm. right around Beltane and, and Sauron. Sauron, yeah Sauron and Beltane are like my big hype and if you think about it you know Sauron up here is Beltane down there so it's like the, the cross quarter area is yes. where I really blossom. Because if, if we look at Lilith, if we look at everything that I represent, it's that beauty, it's that love, it's that sex, but then it's dark and it's death. So that time of like the veils, I guess, and everything um, mm. is, is where my witchiness comes alive. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I have to agree with that 100%. I feel the, the, the idea of, you know, us being practitioners, but also being people. And I want to go back to a point that you made about how like, it's like witch on the go. Um, you know, it's, it seems to be a theme with people. Um, and that the kind of the guilt that comes with, oh, well, I didn't have the time to you know, be outside doing a full moon ritual, or I didn't have the time to create this because I was doing this or that or whatever. And I think there's, and I could speak from my own personal experience, like the, the guilt of, oh, I've been in, you know, home for two years because of COVID. I have no excuse not to do those things. But also, at the same time, the weight of all those things, the, the way I feel about my practice has changed. And sometimes it's those quiet, teeny, tiny little moments. Like you said, it was full moon the other night and I had a really horrible long day at work. I was in my warehouse making olive oil for like 10 hours. And I came home while the moon was rising and I put on some Wendy rule and was kind of like just in the zone while I was driving home, watching the moon rise, kind of like driving like parallel to as it was rising and it was beautiful. Uh -huh. And so I could appreciate the whole moon rise. Yes. That was it. That was it. And then I got home and I had to cook dinner and I had to do the dishes and I had to feed cats. And well, but those yeah. moments are so important. They are two things that that just made me think of. First, you know, I think I started to realize this when I got the vision and, and want to do the, the witchcraft for daily self care. You know, I pitched that to the publisher that I've been working with, you know, right after COVID. Like I had a whole other book that I wanted to do with a, someone else and it just was not the right time to do it. Right. And I'm still struggling to get. It because I still don't feel like we're at the right state yet in the world right. where I can release a very fun, exciting book. Um, so the, I needed self-care. I needed to figure out a ways to reinvent myself. So that's why I did the, you know, the 90 days of self-care mm -hmm. book template situation where it, it, it was little. little you're watching bites. the video. 
This is the one he's talking about. Oh, we and oh my god, I love the artist. It's so good. It's so good. Um, but yeah, that that little book too has really got blown up. I didn't wasn't expecting that book to be as popular and as exciting as it was. I remember it was on the Amazon best new sellers for the whole month that it came out. It's tangible and it's relatable and it's what people need. You know, people need to know that. It's funny because when we were talking before and you were like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to be full glam for our interview. And I was like, yeah, half glam is fine. You know, what's half glam? (laughs) It's just, so Justin and I were like, what's half glam? I don't know. And he's like, is half glam just eyes? I don't know. So. (laughs) Yeah, I was really going to just wear, well, what I really wanted to do, because at one point, like I was telling friends last night while I was, I was like, I have, I can't be like that episode of Sex in the City where Carrie, you know, goes out with her friends all day and like all night and then she oversleeps and then she's late to her interview and right. she looks crazy. Like that's what I thought was going to happen. No. Uh, the and- point being, right? Like half glam, <laughs> if that's all you can do, that's, that's okay. all you can do. Because right. I was like, I was like, I'll probably come in here with a hoodie on. Uh, and- yes, I would have loved that so much. And just be like, oh my God, <laughs> like, oh, where am I? Because that that's literally, it was a thought that crossed my mind. But then I was like, I got other things to do today. So I may as well get up and, you know, but anyways, long tangent. But, you know, I think too, like, I love when you were just talking about, um, you know, driving home, seeing the moon and, you know, that was it. I, it. I find so much. I've seen it over the years, but I see it now too, even more so that I'm a teacher and I do classes and you get the questions from younger students like, well, how do you, how do you do witch, witchcraft every day? And that was a question too in the class the other night. They're like, do you do these elaborate rituals every day? I'm like, no, no, not? no one like, does that. Come on. It's being conscious of yourself. It's being conscious of the environment. It's being, you know, finding empowerment within and, you know, also empowerment doesn't always look glittery and sparkly sometimes it's that dark shit that we go through and feeling pain feeling anger feeling envy feeling jealousy you know all of these things I'm not a a fan of suppressing anything or any of those emotions if they come up they come up I have to deal with it and then I move on and I love that I love that I want to I want to go back to that because it's such a great point is that glam witch and the idea of glam witch and feeling good about yourself and you know that love and love of self and you know all those things that you encompass it confidence and sex magic and all those things that are so root chakra sacral chakra based um sometimes you feel like a giant slug and (laughs) sell right right sometimes right like okay I, i i'm gonna be like the first person to say it like I am the worst at being like a girly girl, right? I hate going to the salon. Hi guys, so I get you on that. <laughs> hate it, hate go. I, you have these beautiful nails. It ma- that makes me crazy. Like I could never, in my youth, I used to get my nails done every two weeks. I could, it makes me absolutely uh, crazy I, out of my mind. I got on this so hard in September and knock on wood, I haven't broken one yet. Like, it's amazing. Like I it's love- amazing. Now. And it's like, oh my God, what's my next one that I'm going to do? Like have my Valentine's Day to like decide it out. And I'm going to my favorite place in the world, Puerto Verde at the end of February. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to have like hot neon yellow yes. ones. <laughs> and like, oh, I have all these nail, nail ideas now. Like, I'm like, shit, this is going to be my life from now on. It's right. all these, <laughs> like, why did I, you know, do this now too? Jeez, I'm never going to see my nails again. <laughs> but my point is to say like, sometimes And I'm sure this is a question that you get, right? That idea of how do I do witchcraft every day? Well, how do I be glam every day? How do I get in touch with that? that, Like I I don't have the energy or the effort to put on makeup. And dude, if I'm being honest with you, since COVID, I don't think I've worn a real bra. Like I, I, sports bras and leggings are my fucking life right now. I don't underwear Monday through Friday. Like as I'm in the house all day. You know like, exactly. So, so where does that where does that meet the 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 desire and the effort of sometimes self care looks like getting dressed nice, putting on your makeup, doing your hair, getting your nails done, and then sometimes self care is the tower card on steroids. Correct. <laughs> right now. Correct. Yeah. Sometimes self care looks like allowing yourself mm-hmm. grace and permission to be yeah. a slug, and I think yeah. that's something that probably you get asked a lot about, right? Because people are very like, yeah. oh my God, he's so glam, he's so beautiful. Is that, well, and, you know, your whole aesthetic 
even in a very, you know, very practical sense of, you know, being here in Chicago and going out, you know, since writing the books and everything, and I, I go out and go to the same kind of restaurants and bars and, you know, all of these t- different places. And I'm kind of now a, a figurehead, like people know who I am at places. Sure. I'm always in my caftan. I'm always made up. I will always rock a pentagram and people are like, who is this bitch? Like, what the fuck is this? Who is she? <laughs> and I'm like, um, you know, so like I've started to go out more now where I'm not made up. Like I don't have my face done. My right. hair is really disgusting underneath. Of, uh, uh. Now, granted, it's all pink from head to toe. There is the hot pink, you know, stocking cap and my hot pink jacket that goes to the floor and my hot pink sweat. Uh, yeah, hoodie. you're really, you're really inconspicuous, Michael. Like yeah, really. Like, I really am a pink witch, but there's, I, I want to talk about that in a minute. Why like pink is a big thing for me, but um. But yeah, they're like, who is this? Like, you are wearing flats, your hair isn't done, your makeup isn't done. Is that what you look like? So when asked me, I was yeah. like, yeah, that's what I look like underneath my makeup yeah. is mad work wonders. Okay. Right. You know, right. I don't have an even complexion. My eyes are purple and baggy underneath. Like, you know, anyways, but um, but yeah, how do you and I think that that's a really fabulous question that you just asked, or you know pose how do you do witchcraft on a daily basis how do you get glamorous on a daily basis it's it can be one thing it doesn't and also it doesn't have to be what I am yes I'm the glamorous I talk a lot you know I share the different things that I do but you know I'm at the same time I'm not preaching for you to wear caftans and get your nails done and do all of these different things you can if you want to but if your glamour is literally like you know uh, a dago tee and a baseball hat and some shoes that's your glamour because it works for you it's what you want to show the world you know and for me at least being an artist you know first and foremost um and loving color and just the idea of art and looking at my body and myself as you know every day as a canvas and also you know somewhat of a performer I'm a ham I like to ham it up you know I had no idea I couldn't tell every single day is a new opportunity for me to be a new character. Mm. So you know, that's how I approach it. I look at it and it can be something completely different for somebody else. And I think it's crazy that we don't have a lot of books on glamour magic either. And I also love that people get the glam witch thinking it's a full book on glamour magic, but you get one chapter that's fully on glamour. Right. But at the end of it, once you really like learn about it and you, you look at everything that I lay out in that book, that's how you do glamour magic. If you look at all right. of the different components, even right. the, you know, the tapping into your, your sixth sense and your psychic power to going and working with your, your shadow self to exploring sex magic and the power of, of pleasure and orgasm to make yeah. things happen and protecting yourself and putting up barriers and things like that. That's all part of glamour magic. So like, I don't know. I lost where I was going. That's okay. I I want to ask you, I want to ask you something else. We know who you are. We adore who you are. And, and in this, let me just say one of the things that myself and I would guess everyone else is so attracted to about your work and your books and your teaching is your unabashed uh, devotion to your individual, your individuality and authenticity. You know, you are a hundred percent who you are and yeah. you don't give a shit. And I think that is fantastic. Um, and, and I, I, I feel like most people don't get to that point until they're much older. Like I, yeah, didn't, I-, I didn't get to that point until I was like in my thirties. And I was like, fuck that. I don't give a shit about it. This is it. This is who I am. And I don't care. You know, a lot of it is, of course, you know, we're, we're in this time where gender identity and expression is different and things are getting more fluid. Finally, uh, finally. But you know what? Like my whole life, I loved the color pink and I couldn't wear it or I could a little bit here and there, or, you know, I really right. wanted more high heeled boot, like a more of a, a man's boot, but with a little bit more of a heel or, you know, right. just something flashy. Or I, I've always worn like, felt like, uh, concealer and you know put on like a base coat and everything to make myself look more presentable um but like now I'm doing eyes like I just learned how to do eyes in the last year and putting that out there like you know and really exploring in different ways to to glam it up and and be artistic um and express myself creatively and a lot of it also comes from being gay and being in the gay culture where it's all mask for mask it's all masculine because there's this fear of femininity it was it, it was passed down on us from our generations with parents mm-hmm. and society where you know if yeah. you were a guy you had to do the guy things you had to be macho and then that created this like whole undercurrent in the gay culture where if you're not masculine then you're also still not a man so it's you kind of get on this lonely island where like if sure. you do embrace your femininity 
identity. Like, oh my God. But so my whole twenties, I was um, like Sarah monogamist in three long-term relationships, boom, boom, boom. And I definitely saw myself in a lot of them catering to what the other person wanted me to be. I had one crazy relationship. I even talk about it briefly in, in the glam witch where it was like, he was my own personal Adam. And I like, when I finally broke free of that and flow away from, you know, being told I have to wear these uh, khakis with this plaid shirt, which oh. I always like, oh. I'm never wearing plaid again. I don't care if it's a plaid caftan. I don't care. That thing can just, that whole fabric look can just burn. Sorry if it's your, I, I hate it because I was forced to wear it for so long and sure. I didn't, I didn't love it. And now I'm, I'm dressing for myself and I feel fabulous. Right. Right. Like I'm not going to show all the way, but my whole, like my whole back is out right now. I love like, it. Clothes. You know, I'm, I'm just having fun. And, um, also what I wanted to mention about pink was, you know, back when I started doing witchcraft and, you know, I loved Fiona Horn and she had all the pink books and everyone hated witchcraft and pink and got a lot of criticism. She was the fluffy bunny, blah, 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 all these horrible terms. And what the hell's wrong with fluffy bunnies? Exactly. Can I ask what the hell's wrong with being cute and sensitive and sweet and, and, and exactly. co conversely as a girl, mm -hmm. as a little girl growing up, I hated pink. I was like, I don't want to be portrayed as, as a weak little girl who likes pink and likes fluffy bunnies. Like, no, I'm a tough girl and I can take care of myself and mur, 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 you know? And I was like, no, I, I did construction for the better part of my late teens and early twenties. And I loved plaid to this day. I love my flannel shirts because I'm a kid of the nineties and grunge was a thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, but it, again, it's so amazing how you look at like, I can remember asking, I was working construction and I asked my mom for, she was like, what do you want for Christmas? And I was like, I want work boots. I need work boots. Like I need steel toe men's work boots because I am literally out there mixing concrete and, and building decks and stuff. And yeah. she got me instead, she got me women's hiking boots. And she's like, well, you don't want to forget that you're a girl. And I'm like, trust me, I'm not going to forget. I have a vagina. Yeah. <laughs> I need the tools for the job I'm doing, even though that's mm -hmm. masculine work and there's nothing wrong with that. So it's yeah. it, both sides and we don't see it because it's so subtle, you know, yes. it's and I, but so I, I, I think that the world is paying more attention to that stuff now, which is nice. Right. You know, I, I remember like even earlier this week, I was on a zoom call and, and there was, you know, someone who's, who's younger and like a straight guy and he saw my nails and he commented on them and like, not like a gross way, like in a, oh, those are really cool. I love that. Like, da, 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 da. and it was just nice to hear. I'm just like, oh my gosh, these younger generations have it so much more figured out than our crazy <laughs> ones did. Yes. Yeah. So and they're so open and they're so like nothing, you know, like nothing it, the phases. Faith, it, they're just like, oh, they just, okay, cool. Whatever. Moving faith on. Faith in like, humanity restored. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. So that's lovely. Um, but yeah, so the, so the books, the pinks and yada, yada, yada. So now that I'm able to express myself and really be around my favorite color, um, and then also looking at the hatred of the pink books once upon a time ago, I want every one of my books to be pink and I'm going to keep rocking the damn pink. I'm going to wear the pink. I want to live in a pink house with a pink car and just like, my, I am my own little Barbie doll. I what does pink, pink, what does pink mean to you? What, what, okay, I so, mean, cause color also has magic and, and vibration okay. and all that stuff. So tell me, what does that mean to you? So, I mean, you know, on this, on the very you know, baseline of, of magic and colors. Of course it has to do with love and friendship and, and, and that, but you know, it, it also to me has a lot to do with harmony and balance, um, joy. Those are the softer pinks, but hot pink to me is just like a funner red. I mean, it's just like laser focused and, and just like in your face, hot, like, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like electric. Yes, that's that word. It's electric. It's electrifying. And you walk into a room and you see it like a bright ass Barbie fuchsia pink. Like that is my favorite color at this point. And also, you know, because then and this is something to think about with glamour magic too that I tell people is figure out what your power color is and not just your favorite one. But I mean, it, it's lovely if your favorite one is, is your power color that looks good on you. But pink really looks good on me, I think. And I hear from a lot of people like pink looks great on you. Like that's a color that really matches your complexion and hair and everything. So um, I love pink. Pink is pink ain't going anywhere. Pink is in my life forever. Is it that it just, and, and okay. So you don't know this about me, but my background is actually um, interior design. So we had to take, yeah. Most people don't know it about me. I actually have a degree in design and um, we, part of taking design school 
was taking like a whole semester of the psychology of color yes. and how color um, affects the brain, what, um, you know, what it triggers, you know, it's funny because I, I, especially in my adult life, I gravitate towards red specifically in my kitchen. And that is, I mean, red, red, red is everywhere. Right. Um, but it's this particular red, it's like apple red, candy apple red. Right. Now I don't, I don't wear it. I'm always wearing black, dark purple, sometimes green. That's kind of it for what I wear. But what I want to see around me is red because it unites me with root chakra. It gives me, uh, it's, it's a color of blood. So it's the color of life. It actually psychologically, um, makes you hungry, which is why often you go to a restaurant and things are red. If you think about, um, the interior is going to sound crazy. If you think about the interior of a McDonald's or a Burger King, the colors are red, green, yeah. and yellow because it's ketchup, pickles, mustard. Must it's those tones that literally make your mouth water. So when you're talking about the magic of color and that pink looks good on you, is mm -hmm. it that it matches your complexion or is it that pink matches your vibration? And yeah. it is something that, um, you know, I definitely the vibration part. Yeah. Right. That heart yeah, opening the, and the practical, and then there's a the magical aspect of it. And right. That, so is there any other colors for you? Yeah. Again, I love yellow is like my second favorite color. Um, and why? It's again, electric, it's vibrant, it's bright. It's in your face. Those oh. are my things and like neons. I love, but I'm, I'm not I'm a fan of like warm color tones. So orange, so it basically goes pink, yellow, orange, three favorite colors. Right I there. love orange. Oh, I love orange. I burnt an orange. orange. Car and I love that little car. Yeah, burnt like a burnt orange. Burnt orange. Bright orange is fabulous. You know, bright ass, like yellow, yellow. I love hot pink, soft pink, all the pinks I love. And red, I red I like, but it's I don't know. It has, it depends on what it is. Like red can either like make me kind of nauseous or like really excited. It depends on where we're going with it and what it's really? on. I love an ox blood, like the dark, rich, bloody red, um, or like a, the candy apple red, it, but it depends on what it is. I don't like it in fashion unless it's like a shoe and that's it, or just an accessory. Yes. I love that. I love like, uh, I, a black, like really yeah. tailored woman's suit or dress with like a red leather belt, a yeah. red shoe and a red bag. Like that, uh, that's, hot, hot. that's my jam right there. Or, or I want a red dress. Like I want to be the, the person at the black tie function <laughs> in my, in my chubby little five foot four Italian meatball frame. I want to be the girl in the red dress always. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But at the same time, like, I don't want to put any effort in. I want to be gorgeous and just, okay. Can we get back to calf hands? Thank you very much. Yes, How in the fucking hell do you rock these calf hands so goddamn hard? Okay. Because again, I am a five foot four Italian meatball woman. I put that on and I look like a potato sack. You put that on and you look like a fucking goddess. Explain it to me. Well, it's also different cuts. You have to find the right cut that works for you because there are certain caftans that I don't like. Like if it's a shorter sleeve one and then it, like the neck is a crew, it doesn't look right on me. Like I like where they're longer sleeves and then I have a, a V-neck because I also have a, sh a shorter stocky neck. So it elongates, that creates that illusion. So th that's one of the reasons. Anyways, I'm going off on the tangent, but- No, I love it. Um, it, it again, it was like right before COVID hit or maybe it was right when COVID hit. Yeah, that's, that was it. There was this brand I was just flipping on Instagram and I saw this new brand called Keftco, Keftans. And I was just like, ooh. And the guy that was doing it was hot and he lived in Chicago and I was like, ooh. So like, then I, you know, got a Keftan. And then I started like getting more, I started looking at it a little bit more. And I found this other guy who made these beautiful, like more elaborate, like fashion, fashion Keftans. And Billy Porter had just been seen wearing one of his items. And I was just like, oh, who is he? Like, I love this stuff. So I started ordering his stuff over and over and over again. And then I was just like, hey, do you do custom stuff? So then I would send him fabrics that I liked and he would make me like clothing and stuff. And he's taking a break at this point, but please Travis, please come back because I need more caftans. This is um, like all you wear at this point, right? Like, didn't you put something up on Facebook and you're like, that's it, I'm never wearing anything ever again that isn't a caftan. 
everything, everything I have. However, I will say the flip side that's bad about caftans is, I mean, it's not restrictive on your body. So you really don't know the cap, like the COVID weight you gain in the caftan if you're not paying attention. Like, I'm just saying. Yeah, I no, mean, no, I get I, that. Oh, wow. Okay. We got to fix that. No, but, I get uh, that. Because I'm living in leggings I, for like yeah. months, I'm, like years. I've been living in leggings now. And I literally the other day I had to put on a pair of jeans and I said to my husband, I'm like, all right, listen, I'm like, right. I was like, um, I don't need to lose weight because I want to get skinny. I need to lose weight to just fit into the jeans I already have. Like, I've I never just- I mean, I'm really putting it out there. I, I didn't like, love them in the beginning. And then this is a funny color story too. Like we're talking about our favorite ones and which ones we vibrate to. But, but I hate blue. I really can't. I hate color. blue. Oh my I, God. A blue. blue jean. I'm like, why are we forced to wear this fucking ugly color? Like, I hate blue. I'm sorry. I know it's the world's most favorite color. And ironically, yellow is the world's least favorite color. And that's my second. But right? yeah, I don't, don't like blue. I, I really Every now and then I'll have a blue something and I'm like, oh, this is actually kind of cute. Like, cause I don't wear it. I really don't want to be around blue. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't like it. Um, but, uh, but no, what some, someone asked me at one point, they're, they're like, well, what are you going to wear when you go back to work? And now like I'm fully remote, but we had to go back and do like a couple of luncheons and stuff right. in the summer. Like, I wore a caftan. I'm Good like, for you. I, now at this point, I'm wearing heels and a caftan. I don't care. You know, if somebody else can wear it, as long as it's not offensive or see-through or something crazy, I'm, I'm rocking it. I'm wearing it. I got my nails. I'm putting on makeup on. I don't, you got a problem with it. Then, you know, oh, well. Like, was that very, was that very, um, uh, that sounds really like out of your comfort zone. Was that very difficult? It was, uh, I mean, definitely the first time doing it, I was kind of like, Ooh, I don't know what's going to happen. But at the same time, there is a little bit of that whole, I don't fucking care attitude in my whole life. And I'll push the boundary. I always love doing that. I did. I mean, I've, I've done that in work in the work co- corporate setting for a while now, even, you know, in the back when I was more, you have to wear the slacks and the shirts and the shoes. Like I mm-hmm. come in with like really pointy toes, like loafers and yeah. like, a Roberto Cavalli shirt that's got snakes and flowers and it's just yep. loud in your face. And so no, and I was shocked because I, I did see a couple people at first look at me and they did the whole up and down. But then <laughs> then like it turned into the like, this is so cool. Da, 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 da. And I got to meet my my boss for the first time in real life. And she was just like, I love you. And I was like, okay, I'm not mm, wearing pants. let's <laughs> yeah, no, fuck pants. <laughs> fuck pants. Seriously. Let's bring that back to what we were talking about before and that glam magic and the self-love and the really being in tune with who you are, that's witchcraft. And I don't care what anybody says that's witchcraft being able to stand in your own skin and stand in your, in your power and say, this is the magic I'm going to do, which is loving self and others will see who I am because I love self and I'm not ashamed. I think oftentimes we don't think of that as magical working. We don't think of that as energetic working, but it really, really is. And I think the story you just told is proof of that. Well, and I, I love this analogy. I don't remember where I heard, but there were, at one point there was like this big debate online, like which movie was better, the craft or practical magic? And then there was this whole big debate about it, blah, 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 blah. And the one side was, well, the craft was better because it showed power and how, you know, like that people were going that way. But then there was the practical magic people where it was like, well, they actually had more like self-love and dignity and yada, yada, yada. So then like, and I'm pretty sure I've talked about it in multiple books, but at the end of the day, witchcraft is about self-empowerment. It's not about having power over others. I think it draw like witchcraft draws yes. a lot of people thinking, oh my God, you know, I, I can have power over other people and I can hex them. And I can look, that's why I came to it. I was getting bullied and I was like, I gotta sh- like conjure up something to make these motherfuckers disappear. But, um, you know, that's not really how it works. You can definitely do that. Yes. I mean, whatever, I'm not going to judge or anything, yeah. but at the end of the day, like the more meaningful witchcraft is going to be centered around, you know, finding out who you are, tapping into your higher self and, and really feeling empowered in all of your actions as as a person not just necessarily magically like every if you're a magical practitioner everything you do on a daily basis is magical you know and that's a big thing with glamour glamour is such an easy thing to do but it's and it's also at the same time like one of the hardest magics to do and it's something we all do on a daily basis anyway with the first thing we do when we wake up we go to the bathroom we look in the mirror the very first thing that most people do when they look in the mirror is look at what they don't like oh i have a zit oh i don't like that gray hair oh look at that wrinkle oh i'm not looking cute today blah 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 blah. when you're doing that a mirror is a magical item it amplifies it reflects so when you're looking and you're putting your intention into what like 
hating yourself or hating that area, then that just like electrifies your whole aura and everything that you're doing. So I always challenge people to look in the mirror and compliment yourself. What do you like? Like, like, you know, not to sound cliche or, or like, like full on mainstream at the moment, but like have a full on Lizzo love yourself moment in the mirror and be like, damn, I look hot. I'm 100% that witch, 100%, like do it. Um, and that's where you start to change and feel different. And that's practical magic. It's there's magic to every little item that we have in our entire life. Eventually, when you've been practicing for a long time, you learn like you don't need necessarily the circle and all the different things for spells. You things can just happen for you because you're constantly tuned in. So be mindful of your actions and what it is that you're putting out there because that's that's magic. <laughs> That is so effing brilliant. And on that note, I want to take a quick break so that we can hear from our amazing, amazing sponsors. And then we'll be right back with the fabulous, I, I, there's not a big enough word for the fabulosity of Michael Herkus. So uh, stay with us. We'll be right back after uh, our little ads. And we don't actually take a break. We so don't if you need to go pee or coming out and the ring light, hold on. Okay. <laughs> Do it, go. Okay, we are back with the amazing <laughs> Michael Herkus and he has his kitchen. What is your kitten's name? This is Mr. Fuji. He turns 11 next month. He's oh, a Mr. big- Mr. Fuji. <laughs> oh, look at him. Oh, he's so beautiful. Oh, I love it. Look at his belly. Oh, I just want to squish him. He is huge. Yes, he is. He's a he's big huge. 20. Now he's, he he's done. Like, I'm done. I'm out of he here. He loves you so much. He's just like, okay, daddy, I'm done. I'm done He's now. Like, I don't do this. You know, I come to you when I want to be touched. You don't touch me. Okay. Yeah. Like that cat life. Like, why can't I have be a house cat? Like, come on. Like, that's the, that's like the ultimate. That's literally my spirit animal. I just want to lounge around the house all day. Have Look pretty. Me, have and, someone else clean up my shit. And yeah. when, go away. Like yes. that was always my life. Like, let me have, let me, where's that man? Keep I, me like a house. I want to be kept like a house cat. That's my life. That's I'm my goal. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure there's someone out there who would be very willing to do that for you. I mean, look at that smile. Who wouldn't want to, who wouldn't want to keep you? Who wouldn't want to keep you? <laughs> um, okay. So before the break, we were really talking about, God, I just loved what you said about the mirror being a magical tool that amplifies what you're seeing, what you're putting in. I think that's just, I just think that that's, that's so brilliant. And, and it's really something that I'm going to take away from this conversation because you're a hundred percent right. And when we look in the mirror, what we see is the things we hate about ourselves instead of focusing on, yeah, even if it's something. And conditioned to do that. But yeah, sorry. To yeah, even off. even if you were just look at yourself and say, well, maybe I don't like the way I look physically today, but I woke up this morning. I'm excited to go to my job that I love, or I have a beautiful home that I live in. Finding gratitude, which is a very big part of the work that I do, um, you know, finding gratitude even in those moments where you know, yeah, okay, I might be an overweight girl, but my body's healthy, and so I'm oftentimes going, I'm finding gratitude for my healthy body. I'm finding gratitude for, you know, the fact that my arms and legs move like, okay, so maybe I need to lose a few pounds, but like, you know, I, ha I went to a seminar once and I, I, it was like totally random. I was at like this small business seminar and I wandered into this class. I was like, I had a couple minutes to kill. And the facilitator, I, I couldn't even tell you what his name was, but he's made everybody in the class look, he's like, okay, everybody look at your hands. And so we all like looked at our hands and he was like, okay, really look at them, really look at them and now thank them because every mm -hmm. single thing you have in your life is because of your hands. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, like every I'm meal, every meal I've ever made, every person I've ever hugged, every, every place I've ever driven, I've held the steering wheel with my hands, every Christmas card I've ever written, like all of that is because has been done by these hands hands is that like mind-blowing i love it i i and actually it might be in the upcoming book that i'm writing i've written it at some point but a, a little ritual to do a self-love ritual where you you kiss your hands and then you kind of then like take that energy and you kind of are like hug yourself and then you hold it over your heart and you just start to like like literally physical self-love like moment where you give thanks to the body for everything that you put it through. Cause we put our bodies through crap. <laughs> we do. And, and then we beat them up for it. There's a chapter in my book 
um, on self-love. Well, there's a whole section of my book on self-love and we do talk about loving the self physically, especially as a woman. And people are like, there's a chapter on masturbation in your cookbook. And I'm like, yes, yes, honey. It, it is so important to understand our bodies, especially as magical practitioners. If you want to work with the energies of loving self and loving others and loving your body, you have to understand how it works. You have to understand what things feel like, Absolutely. you know, and, and finding comfort in whatever body you're in right mm -hmm. now we've talked a lot about your journey, um, with glam, Witch and, and the work that you're doing now, can you tell us about what brought you to this place? Like, were you always this confident, uh, you know, full of life person, or was this part of your journey? And how did that journey of self-discovery dovetail into your practice of witchcraft? Um, it may have actually been reversed. Like, I think the witchcraft was the, like the thing that made it happen. I mean, I was, I was a practicing witch for all of my, you know, teens, all of the teen years from junior high hell to high school bullshit. To, and how did you find that in your early teens? Like, how did that? I, I found it because, well, I was, I was of course in love with all of the glamorization of Hollywood witches in the nineties. So all of the movies, I mean, I mean, the wicked witch of the West, I mean, literally everything, every right. type of there was just something intriguing about them. And then I, of course, loved snakes growing up. I would catch snakes and I was just yes. fascinated by them. I loved the moon. And then, you know, I start, of course, and then I loved any kind of lead role with a, a powerful feminine force. So Pink Ranger, not that that's like the most powerful feminine force, but, um, you know, as a kid, that that's that. And then, of course, you know, the Tina, and then that leads to Buffy. And then Buffy starts talking about witchcraft and Wicca. And then you have Willow and... I Right. Oh God, and Buffy. So, so then I get, the, then I'm at the store and I see Wicca and I'm just in witchcraft. I always wanted to be a witch. And then it's like, Ooh, it was this exotic spiritual thing. And so, you know, I, witchcraft helped me a lot. I, I mean, I remember being, you know, in high school freshman year and I came out to friends, but then there was this one, this group of people that came up and they like pushed me against my locker and they were going to like do a, a throwdown. Mm -hmm. And they were like, Hey, are you gay? And then I was just like, yeah. And they were like, damn, you admitted it. That's cool. Okay. Bye. Like, it was just the fact that I had the balls to say it, I guess, you yeah. know, the, not the right word to say it anymore, but um, like just because I had the confidence to say it. So I definitely started to evolve into a more confident person from witchcraft, from the things that I was, I was doing. I mean, a lot of it was that self-empowerment or doing a confidence spell or something along those lines. And then it came to me moving to the city and trying to put myself out there, but still being timid. But then I, you know, I, I dated a, a couple of people and, you know, despite those relationships failing and not working or the toxicity of them, I learned something from each one of them, especially, you know, one of them where I got to travel a lot. I got to see the world. I got to experience a couple of different things that people, you know, in the 23, 24 don't usually get. So I learned from, from watching that. And at the same time, growing in my practice as a witch. Um, and then I think the culmination of it was when I decided to start writing and putting myself out there and really immerse, immersing myself into the community more. Because when I first moved to the city and like 20 years old, from the suburbs, because I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, I was so excited to be like, oh my God, I'm gonna meet witches. I'm gonna join a coven. I go to this one store and I'm like, oh, it's a meetup. And all that store did was blast the other store and we was like, we're gonna fight them and we're gonna burn down their store. And it just turned into this big old crap. I'm like, I just left high school. I'm not trying to deal with all of this. Right? So I was just like, fuck yeah. it. Like I'm supposed to be with other witches. So my pretty much then from 20 to like 28-ish, I guess was when I, like started writing for which I think 20 and 29 I, like my whole 20s basically I was completely solitary underground not telling anybody what I was doing you know I had moments where my practice kind of fizzled out and it was very you know more of a low and every now and then I would you know tap into you know my witchcraft or, or look at a full moon or, or just something like that but then it started to reinvigorate um you know in my late 20s I went to Porta Verda by myself and it was there that I felt so in touch with myself more magically also being alone there and that was mm. traveling alone it really takes you out of your comfort zone and i i really yeah. recommend everybody go on a trip somewhere by alone, yourself. alone alone 
And I remember, because I was more like, I wasn't always the outgoing person that talks to strangers and stuff. And then I was there and then I'd gone there a couple of times. Actually, I talk about Puerto Vallarta a little bit in the Glam Witch and my self-care chapter. Um, I went, it, it was a self-care experience for me. I took myself on this trip. Um, and then people were like, you know, on vacation and they were in the pool next to me and I heard them talking and then I just butted my, you know, self in like, oh, well, you were talking about that. Well, this is a place that I recommend. And right. then I started to more people and they liked it. And then I came home and I started doing that in more places. And I just thought so much more from that. And but at the same time, I mean, I think a lot of people think I'm ex definitely an extrovert. I'm an extroverted introvert. I need to be an introvert Monday through Friday to be an extrovert on the weekends. <laughs> so I, I love my alone time and people Same, same. Like I'm I so like <laughs> out there, right? That personality. And when I'm working or when I'm teaching a class or when I'm at an event or whatever, and I'm like, kitchen witch, this is the kitchen witch, this is the kitchen witch, kitchen witch. And then I'm like, okay, and I'm done now. And now yeah, I need to go home and I need to sit on my couch and I need to, I need to be quiet and I need, ah, Right? Yeah. And now, you know, I've, I've gotten to this point and, you know, um, I hate using the term public figure, but I mean, at the end of the day, we are, we're, we're authors, people know who we are. Exactly. But like now, I mean, that definitely, of course, brought a little bit more confidence too. Um, it just does, you know, but even in just my whole this, I'm, I wear the makeup a lot. I wear this outfits a lot. I wear the heels a lot because I never got a chance to once upon a time ago. And I'm really loving it right now. So yeah, who knows in 10 years, I might just go back to like sweatpants and hoodies all the time. But right now I'm enjoying this because I feel like I, I have to make up for lost time where I wasn't confident enough to wear these outfits or be as bold as I was. And I'm not going backwards. I'm just going to keep doing this. And I definitely think too, seeing it from role models, like, of course, you know, all of this happened with Billy Porter, Jonathan Vaness from Queer Eye, like the, the, the people in the, the world that have the visibility and the, the I guess, the, the platform um, who can show it. And then we see it and then we see people's reactions and it was good. So it was just kind of very inspiring, I guess, in, in the grand scheme of things. And someone at one point called me the Jonathan Vaness of witchcraft. And 100%. I was just like, oh my God, I love hundred percent. Fabulous. hundred percent. I've also called the lady of witchcraft. I don't think I'm that, I, I would love to be, but I don't think that that's accurate. Um, yeah, I've been called a lot of things, but I, I, I love it. I, I just, am, I'm loving where where I am in, as far as that goes. I mean, of course, there's the different things about my life that I don't like, and we all have those those down times. I mean, even hell, like we just talked about the mirror thing. Uh, five times out of the week, I'm probably the one that's looking in the mirror being like, ew, I don't like that, or that I'm not looking hot today. You know, so I ha I'm not perfect. I do the same things that everybody does. We're all human at the end of the day. Um, I'm not practice. perfect. I don't know uh, It's a practice, right? It's practice, not yeah. perfection. We don't call it perfect witchcraft. It's a craft. It's, you know oh, what I mean? It, write that book soon. What are these little Instagram influencers? They will write. Perfect. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not perfect. perfect. Anyways, no, that. it's, it's craft craft, meaning something you're always working on just like yeah. self. So like, I want to bring that back to what we were talking about in the very beginning of this conversation. And we were talking about how we should always be evolving as people, as individuals, as witches, in our practices, we're always evolving, right? So to say that where I am right now, I'm very grateful for where I am right now, as you're saying, but I don't know if I'm going to stay here. And then I'll take what I learned from this phase to into the next phase and continue to move forward in my practice and my craft and in my self evolution. These things are not separate, at least not to me, you know, the practice of craft, witchcraft, the practice of self evolution, they are not separate. They're not separated. The practice of loving the self and everything that you're talking about. It's not this one thing over here that I do. As you said, in the beginning of the interview, everything we do every day is magic, right? Yes. There is no delineation between this and that it's all one. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I appreciate your, your honesty and candor and saying like, you are that person in the middle in the morning going, I hate this thing or focusing on that thing because yeah. The reality is that's your work. So you're not sitting yeah. over here going, do this, but I'm not going to do it. You do it. Do, I'm just going to say, I'm going to do it. Yeah, you're I'm gonna, actually I, I've already done it. I've elevated from that. I'm so grand and fabulous. No, no, I think that's one of the things about you and your work specifically in the world is that you really do walk your walk. And there are a lot of people in general <laughs> 
that, that, and not even, not just in our community, right? Um, yeah, the world. The every, world every. Um, that say, oh, I'm going to write this book or I'm going to do this thing or I'm a witch or I'm a pagan and blah, blah, blah. And these are the ideals that I stand up to, but they'd be the first per- people to talk shit about you behind your back or they're the first people to, you know, like you said, you went to this shop and all they did was complain about the other shop. Like I, that's not what our community is supposed to be about, right? Oh, so, what are we doing? Well, right on. what are we doing here um, i thought we were gonna do a ritual and call some corners and you know i don't know maybe have some wine and talk right. about which but all we did was talk about bitch stuff and i'm not having that <laughs> correct correct so i i think it's it's so great that you are so, it, an example of being able to to stick to like the integrity i i'm big on integrity and i love people who are yeah. just who they are um and uh-huh. and do what they say they are going to do and be who they say they are. And you're just such a shining light of an example for that, not just for the witchcraft community, but also for the queer community. And it's beautiful. So congratulations to you for being fucking outstanding. I'm just saying. Um, Thank you. So I know you have, we don't have a lot of time left. Okay. Well, how much time do we have? What time is it? Like 10 minutes, maybe 15 so, oh, okay. and I have to jump on another, I have another interview. So, um, but I, I want to make sure that we get in everything. So okay. I know you have, we've been talking so much about glam, Witch. oh yeah, we've been, ta- yes. <laughs> right. And then we've been talking about a self-care book and I know you have some other projects kind of like in the wings. I don't know if there's anything you're allowed to talk about or any teasers you can give us or anything particular that you have coming up, like a class or a workshop that you're doing that you want to tell us all about. Yeah, so I'm a part of WitchCon next month, uh, which is an online uh, witchcraft um, festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm teaching a a new class, one that I haven't taught before. um, And it's about Lilithian astrology, which I do cover in the Glam Witch, um, looking at the different points of Lilith in your chart um, to kind of figure out your shadow self and how to work with that. Uh, so that's really the fun thing that I'm, I'm doing. Um, I have another book that's coming out probably around April, but I can't uh, talk fine. too much about that. Can we talk uh, about Lilith but, for a hot minute? Oh, we totally can talk about Lilith. Right. Yeah. Because we've only touched a little bit on Lilith and, um, for people that might not, who might be new to witchcraft, listening to this podcast, watching this video, tell us who Lilith is to you okay. and why you like so, working with her so much. Okay, so um, if you haven't heard about Lilith, I'll give you the big, like the, th- the three sentences that people know the most about her. She was Adam's first wife who left him and the Garden of Eden um, because he wanted to dominate her and be on top of her during sex. So she left the Garden of Eden, went to a cave by the Red Sea, started having sex with a bunch of demons, became this big demon, then became like the bride of Lucifer and she's the evil boogie woman of everything. Um, So that's the story that everyone kind of knows. But what I love about her, if we really go back in time and we look at the 5,000 years that she's been active, you know, she's one of the, if not the oldest female spirit that has been continuously examined through the world like didn't have a moment where they died down like we have gods and goddesses and spirits that come and go through different cultures and things like that but Lilith has stayed present she was inadvertently worshipped through fear for a very very long time Mm. um so I love that idea of just kind of like there's no such thing as bad press. I'm going to stay true to who I am and I'm going to wear every single fucking name you give me. But at the end of the day, I'm still around, bitch. What you going to do? Like that's I the- I love it. I love it. But if we go back to like who she was in Sumerian time or the prototype of what Lilith was, you know, she was the handmaiden to the goddess Ishtar Anana, who was the highest- like female being at that time and she was the priestess of the sex temple so she would go out and bring the men in she was also the guardian of Inanna's sacred tree um the bird lived at the top and could go up into the heavens the snake at the bottom could go into the underworld and there she was the world tree in the middle so she's the keeper of wisdom and secrets and all these different things and when the patriarchy was coming in and the old gods and goddesses were dying out it's almost as though in my opinion Lilith ate in honor or Ishtar she like she took over she um 
what's it called? It's very American Godsish. She she took over. Anyways, um, I think if people understand what I'm trying to say, uh, they they merged or something along those lines, and you know that's become who Lilith is today. What she really stands for. We hear these stories of her being a child killer, a seductress of men. I mean, these are all ridiculous labels, but if we really look at it, yes, maybe child killer because she represents sexuality for pleasure over procreation. So that's Ooh. really what. And she also, um, she owns her sexuality, her, and she wants everyone to literally engage in all of the pleasures that life has to give, all of the fun, all of the, in some ways, hedonistic aspects of life. And so that's why she's a huge role model for me and has helped me come into so much confidence. Um, she's glamorous because she's the temptress. She's, you know, she's the shapeshifter. She does all of that. Um, and, and I just really see her as a goddess of our generation at this point, who we need, who we should be tapping into, um, because she does represent equality, sexuality, sexual freedom, um, individuality, uh, standing up for yourself, empowerment, personal power, all of these fabulous things that people are starting to wake up to. Um, and the more I think people start working with her and calling on her, the more we're going to get to a place of, of better. So I love how the, the thing about her, you know, that most people know mm -hmm. is, you know, that she was Adam's first wife and, yeah. you know, basically got kicked out of Eden for, you know, basically having an opinion, you know, yeah. that's, you know, how most well, people, that right. That was created. I mean, that story was created because they realized after a while that in Genesis, there was a misnomer where it's like, or not a mis, well, there was a faux pas uh, where it talks about how there was man and woman. And then the next chapter, it's like, well, you know, we now made another woman, Eve. So it was like, who right. was that other? But then right. they made this higher, which was, oh, look, don't be like Lilith because this is what happens and she's going to be a demon. But it's just, it's crazy. If we even look at some of the whole like folklore and legends about her at, at, at times where it was like, women weren't allowed to look in mirrors. You had to put mirrors up in the house because Lilith would get you because what is she? She's going to help you feel good about yourself and your reflection. Mirrors are very sacred to her. Mm -hmm. So it's just, she's so fascinating. And then I'll share this one little tidbit if we have time, but yeah. I love talking about it. But in the book, a lot of people love the history section that I put together because keep in mind, this is 20 years of research. So much research went in uh, just in, in my own personal want to find out more about her. And so that chapter was originally like 70 pages long. And my editor, Tanya Brown of Which Way Magazine was just like, okay, we need to redo this because the whole book has personality, but this sounds like a 10 grade like history paper and i had to go through it like 10 times and she's like finally michael get drunk i need you to get shit face drunk and record yourself talking about lilith's yeah. history so yeah. i did that and i transcribed it and that's how that chapter came to be that's freaking which, hysterical but, but i always love that because that's a fun how it like behind the the book behind the yeah. book of uh how that was created but um but yeah i wish i mean because that i mean i could write a whole book on lilith's history and have that go out oh my god you should but, you should Maybe. because there there isn't enough real content about her or how to how to work with her right like it's not there there's a lot of analysis of the history but correct. there's not at like one point i would love to write a fiction story that really retells her story like from her perspective and how it's all merged along along the timeline and here she is now and yeah. what she's doing in this world right now as an archetype. So I would love to do that at some point if I ever have time. And I right, don't Right, the stop. archetype of Lilith is that that woman who is in, in control of her body, in control of her sexuality, someone who uh, is knowledgeable, but also is, should tell you how the fuck it is, right? Knowledge. And should be like, Absolutely. no, it can't be this way or it has to be that way or do what you want, you know, but this is what I know, like this sort of, um, too, too smart for everybody else in the room. And so instead of listening to her, they talk down to her, right? They're like, well, oh, they dismiss, they dismiss now, her. Like now talking about her, now that you've like heard, we've talked about all of these different parts of my life and everything. Now, is it a surprise that that's the goddess that claimed me basically at birth? Not, <laughs> not at all, not at all. And I, I wonder um, how, how her energy has been leading you through the threads of your life and how you know, like where, if you look back retrospectively, oh, she really know. has, 
it, a lot of it is that kind of what I had mentioned too in my 20s, just continuously dating stupid guys. And I let I allowed the, I allowed them to be the Adam and I allowed myself to be Eve. And I ignored Lilith and I talk about it. Like there was moments where she broke all of the statues in my house of her. And that was the hugest wake up call to get out of, of one of the relationships because I was like, oh, she's pissed. But then another one broke the next day. And it was just like, what the hell? She has a habit of breaking, breaking statues. A lot of people that work with her talk about that. Really? Um, but, uh, but I, uh, you know, so many people think that I would work with Aphrodite. I will say that I think that Lilith is the combination of Aphrodite and Hecate energy. That's the best way I can describe it for people that aren't, aren't too I, familiar yeah. or nervous about working with her. She's the temptress and seductress, but she is the witch. She is the, has the knowledge, has the power and all of the Hecate stuff, but she's that temptress and seductress like Aphrodite. You know, we use that word temp- temptress or seductress. But really, in my view, a seductress only shows you what you already wanted. Yes. Right. It's you, I'm not showing you something or, or offering you something that you don't already want. Yes. I am just showing you it's available to you. Yes, and I'm, you- if, if you're tempted by that, you're tempted by that. Mm-hmm. I am a neutral party. I'm just showing you what you I'm can have going- if you want. <laughs> right. If you have, if you're brave enough. I- I think that's fabulous. Yeah, right. And definitely her, you know, I, I call her a queer goddess because she, I mean, she, she truly is. I mean, if, if, at least if we go back to the whole pleasure, uh, sex for pleasure rather than procreation, try as we may, like I'm not going to be able to do that. So, um, you know, that, that's, uh, uh, that has always been like a, a focal point in my mind too. Like, you know, I'm, I'm worshiping this queer goddess. Yes, yes. So I don't know. Are that's, there any, my- are there any masculine gods? Are there any, masculine energies you enjoy working with or are you nope. very very focused on these others on the on the I'm goddesses that in a monogamous relationship with Lilith I mean there's been goddesses that have come in at one at certain points that have been kind of like I've I felt the call but I I get the whole like Lilith's wing wraps around like nope this one's you're mine. with me we got work to do we can't deal with you right now so who knows maybe somewhere down the line I mean I've kind of gotten a little bit of interest in Lucifer because there oh, is God, that yeah. Lucifer and Lilith energy where their stories intertwine a little bit and it was more Samuel which is technically really different than Lucifer if we want to get into the the real nitty-gritty of it but um I started to kind of have a little bit of an interest in kind of exploring that a little bit more um so yeah Lilith has presented that in front of me I've also had some interest in looking more at Ishtar and Inanna and even Aphrodite to a point but again you know it went Inanna to Ishtar to Astarte to Aphrodite I mean that was the evolution of one goddess uh, like throughout different cultures mm-hmm, and the mm-hmm. Lilith was the handmaiden to that so there is that relationship between Aphrodite and Lilith there, there is um, absolutely so absolutely I mean it's, it's impossible the- to, to ignore that connection and yeah I just found it really cool because I have Hungarian background but I've never actually looked at like Hungarian mythology which is interesting and sure enough what do I find there is a Lilith in Hungarian mythology. Um, and I can't pronounce her name, but it starts with an S and it ends with a Y. And she was basically this beautiful maiden goddess with white hair and a white dress. And she uh, was a goddess of storms, which Lilith was connected to in the past. And uh, she was demonized by everyone for her beauty. And, you know, like really crucified for that, AKA Lilith, but she's a, a goddess of love and beauty and puddles are like the mirror to her world. And that's one way that you know that she's around. It's just a really interesting story. And I really am excited to kind of explore her a little bit more, especially since that's lineage wise, like at least in this body, in this yeah. lifetime, like where I kind of come from. So that's, um, that's a fun new it's, thing. It's brilliant. And you're brilliant. And you know, you know, so much, you have such a, a wealth of knowledge from all the years of research, um, with Lilith. I think if you wrote an allegory of her life, yeah. it would be so great. And again, like, I feel like that kind of thing. What? Maybe yeah. Once I'm, I'm out of other ideas, like I want to put the fiction on like hold until I'm done writing all of the other witchcraft books that I feel compelled to write, which there's about probably 10 more. Well, the so. thing is it's, it's a fiction, but it's an allegory. It's, it's basically saying I'm, I'm writing this story with all these high points that is based on the mythology, but in a way that I feel like people can absorb <laughs> oftentimes, don't you feel like people that write about, and not, not, I mean, not everybody, but sometimes these books that are, you know, devotional to the goddesses or the gods or whatever, they, they, sometimes they read like stereo instructions. And you're like, okay, you know, like I can't identify 
with the parts of this goddess that I want to see myself in or see the goddess in myself because it's not put in a term that I can be like, oh yeah, I do that same thing because they're not humanized. And to do something like that in an allegory would allow someone to be able to go, oh, right. I identify with this. I get this story. Like how have I been vilified as a smart, in charge, you know, sexually powerful woman all the time, all the time. Right. So Lilith is a, is an energy that is, she's an energy that I can completely understand, but I'd love to have a story where she's the main character that I can identify with. I think it would be fun. I mean, I I want to do it, and I I the storyline is kind of in my head. I honestly need to write it down because I, I, just fiction to me seems so hard to write. I mean, I could I have written book after book of nonfiction, but fiction to me just seems like such a hurdle. But I I do like a challenge, and I would love to do that at some point. So oh, you'd be so good at it. You'd be so good at well, it. Look at the history. I mean, I've already written the history, so let me love plop in some plot lines and stuff. Yeah. You know? We'll go from there. Yeah. And when but, it comes out uh, 10 years from now, I want to sign copy. I'm just exactly. Saying. And then hopefully, then it's like up taken by Netflix and becomes a show. Uh, hey! Yeah. Let's do that. that. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm the character in all the fucking shows. So, I mean, obviously, I, have you watched Lucifer? I have not watched Lucifer. I, the reason why I can't get into the guy that plays him, I just am not into him. That sounds like wait, 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 wait. You're not into Tom Ellis. There's something about him where I'm just like, I, he's not a believable Lucifer to me. But have you watched it? I have. I watched a little. I've watched like three episodes, and I was just like, I'm it's not into. So good. Oh, <laughs> I'm so good, and I'm sorry, but he's so beautiful. He's so you know, Ooh, Tom Ellis. Ooh, and and love, he's love, and it's tis the season. The Love Witch. Have you watched The Love Witch? No. Okay, you got to watch Love Witch. I haven't even heard of this. What is oh my the God. Love Witch? The Love Witch is the story about Elaine and she's a witch and she uses love and sex magic and is also kind of somewhat a serial killer. Um, Ooh, fun. It's set, up, it's set up to look like it's in the 60s, but it's not. It's actual modern time. And literally halfway through the movie, you start seeing like the cars and the flat screen computers and cell phones and you're like wait a minute this is modern time but it's a really interesting campy film the the visuals are beautiful it was shot in 35 millimeter um it is to date the only witchcraft movie i've seen where they actually do like real witchcraft rituals like it's there i want to say it's like um guard uh guard the white gardenian yes gardenarian uh, gardenarian gardenarian uh, yes i was gonna say gardenian gardenian, gardenian, gardenian. i want to say it's more of like a gardenarian um uh, like setting with the coven and stuff like that, but they really use like real witchcraft in this. And what the platform story- is this on? Oh, I'm pretty sure you can watch it on like Amazon Prime, and you can rent it like on any of the digital things. Awesome, um, awesome. I, I multiple times in the theater when it comes, but it is it does have kind of a. Um, I mean, to me, it's definitely camp. You can't. It's no one's taking themselves seriously with this thing. Love it. it the acting is kind of like an old school play. Um, but that's kind of the charm to it because it's just like what? Because then you like I love this character because she's a witch and she's so powerful and like love magic. But she, girl is delusional, like, and I love it, like, because you want to be on her side, but she's right. also the in the whole story. So right. watch this; it's a fabulous movie. Okay, I'm totally gonna watch it. Okay, so we're just about out of time, um, okay. and I feel like it sucks because I could literally talk to you all day because I, I heart you so big, and I'm so glad we finally. <laughs> I'm so glad we finally got to do this. Like seriously, it's right? A lot of fun. It's so fun. So, um, tell okay. So tell everybody where they can find you online, website, Insta, Facebook, all that jazz, and if they want to buy your books. So, um, th- my website is the number one like top shop for everything. So go to my website www.theglamwitch.com. It's all one word, theglamwitch.com. Um, it has links to buy all of my books. It has links to all of my social medias, and I'm sure everyone listening is all aware of the imposter situation that's going on on Instagram. Yes. I seem to have every week. Uh, I think I've had 20 yeah. at this point. Um, so, you know, I'm not messaging people in their DMS or any of that crazy stuff. The way to find my real profile is to go to that one. I only have one. And, um, you know, the website also has, you know, if you wanted a tarot reading or an astrology reading, I do offer those services as well. Um, but yeah, it connects to all my different social medias, Facebook, my YouTube channel, all of the different things. So check it out. Excellent. The glam, witch.com. Michael Herkus, the most amazing, fabulous, fantastic, I heart you so big. Okay. So one last question. And I ask this to every one of my guests. 
Cool. Um, it's totally random. Okay. As a kitchen witch, uh-huh. what is one dish you would want me to cook for you and why? Oh, I would want you to cook me a steak. I, I love steak. Do um, you? I, I'm a big steak fan. Um, and I just, I don't know, I can see you doing it really good with maybe like a cherry glaze or something interesting on it or, or something along those lines. Something I, has I to know. be pink, right? It has to be pink. Yeah, and it has to be rare. Yeah, so the pink is going to be the meat. But <laughs> right. So so we've got to have like um, a rare, a really rare, a, a rare really- steak, maybe a, a nice cut of skirt steak. Ooh, with yeah, some sort like- of like a pink peppercorn. Ooh, you got me already. Yes. <laughs> that sounds fabulous. Pink peppercorn. And then you'd have to put it with something. So maybe like, I don't know. I'd have to think about what could be on the side that could be, that could be pink. Like, like potatoes or but they have to be special oh. potatoes. They'd have to be like a pink <laughs> right, right, right. Red potatoes with the skins on with mm. some sort of, uh, like you said, like some, there's gotta be like some sort of like cherry compote. I'm really into cherries oh, right yeah. now. Right. And cherry so, with red meat. So, I mean, that's, yeah. A cherry compote, something, something or other there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mm. like this, but yeah, that's my thing. It's, I would it's, not have pegged you for someone who's like really into red meat. Oh, no, like, <laughs> I, didn't, I mean, hey, but I'm <laughs> this it's red meat and salt like that's my whole life <laughs> I love I'm so much more of a salty person than a sweet person I can't get into sweets unless it's like a not bitter sweet like oh and you if you like drinks like there's one drink that I was introduced to from a witch in New Orleans love her Christine um it's equal parts frangelica and vanilla vodka delicious because it's 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 sweet but it's not overly sweet there's the bitterness that's there that's that like hazelnut like nutty oh. thing going I, I love, love doing it. after dinner drink because it's strong. You can taste the alcohol. There's a little bit of sweetness, but it still has that. This is not overly like yeah, sugar. syrupy, sweetie. It's yeah. Syrupy. It's light. It's refreshing. Yeah. Um, has that has the hint of what a dessert should be in my opinion. Oh, I love it. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being thank here. You. This has been so wonderful. I could talk to you forever. Hopefully we'll get to do this again sometime. And, uh, I just, I've had the best time. So thank you so much. Uh, remember everyone, check out Michael at theglamwitch.com. Um, and for everyone out there, thank you for listening. And until next time, I wish you many, many blessings and uh, so much gratitude. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>